Welcome back. We're glad you found your way to the bonus content, and I hope you enjoyed A Most Beautiful Thing. Again, my name is Russell Field from the Canadian Sport Film Festival. As part of this bonus content, you'll see a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Arshay Cooper, hosted by Perdita Felicien, a two-time world champion and a two-time Olympian, one of Canada's most accomplished track and field athletes, a 10-time national champion and record holder. Currently a CBC broadcaster and a motivational speaker, among other things. She's also the author of the recently released memoir, My Mother's Daughter, which I hope you have a chance to check out. Before Perdita speaks to uh, Arche, a couple of words first from Canadian national team rower, Victoria Nolan. Hi, this is Victoria Nolan coming to you from Rowing Canada's National Training Centre in Victoria, British Columbia where I am training with the rest of Team Canada, getting ready for the Tokyo Games set to take place later this summer. I am thrilled to be a part of this Q&A session with Arshay Cooper. Although our stories are very different, I found myself identifying so much with Arshay's rowing journey. When I was 18, I found out that I was going blind. And at age 30, after having my two children, that's when the lights went out for me. I was afraid to leave my house. I was afraid that I wasn't going to be a good mom. I was afraid that I didn't have a future to look forward to. But then I found rowing. And like Arche, being out on the water helped me to feel safe, gave me a community to belong to, and a new sense of purpose. Most importantly, it restored my confidence. Rowing was such an important part of my life that in 2007, I made the national team. And since then, my team and I have won seven medals for Canada, including bronze at the Rio Games in 2016. Rowing has also helped to propel me to be successful in many other areas of my life. So my hope is that Arche's message will reach the rowing community so that we can seek out ways to make rowing more inclusive and to bring in people who otherwise might never have found themselves inside a rowing club. Okay. Arche, you made a sports history when you captained the first all black rowing team. Uh, you did that in high school, never been done in American history, right? Right now you're an activist, you're a motivational speaker. Do you still consider yourself a rower? <laughs> Sometimes, depends on the day. <laughs> people, like me, people like me with the hurdles. People are like, can you still hurdle? Uh, that's debatable, right? <laughs> and I just really, really connected with your story. One, it's, it's so positive and it's so um, inspiring. And honestly, with everything that we're going on right now, have going on in the world right now, Look, we need those stories. Like, we need the stories like you, like yours. I really want to start at the beginning, right? Yeah. With you being on this team, with your teammates. But honestly, this is, um, this is, is from your memoir, right? This is what inspired the film. So can you tell us how that came to be? The film? Yeah, you know, like, you know, honestly, before the book came out, before the film, for the last 15 years, everyone kept talking about this story locally. Only those who were there to live it knew the story. And there's so many of those stories. No one said it should be a book. It's like, it should be a movie one day. It should be a movie one day. And I was like, you're right. But, uh, you know, I was the captain. Uh, I can, you know, I can story tell a little bit. So let me get, let me, let me write something. But, you know, that, that was just the thought. But it wasn't until... 15 years after graduating high school, going back to speak at the school that I went to and also speaking to the surrounding schools and hearing the questions from all the young people and the things they are going through, I said to myself, nothing has changed. They're still battling the same structural limitations that we went through growing up, right? Like a place where talent is everywhere, but access and opportunity is not. Right. And then when opportunity do presents itself, there are so many hesitations because the sport may be foreign or there's so many systemic obstacles like transportation or swimming or costs. And um, but I was I wanted to tell that story about these young, talented people in a place like Chicago. But not only that, also tell the story of what happens when passionate people 
come together to give their time, talent, and treasure the change you can make, not only at that time, but 20 years later. I get goosebumps just hearing you describe that, right? The fact that it was almost like local folklore, like local legend, everyone knew about it, right? But you fast forward 15 years later, it's still happening. There's still people who have the ability, right? To do great things, but the opportunity was lacking. Did you know when you were a part of this team? And we should say, everyone I'm sure has seen the film at this point, but you know, I think it was the second most violent high school in Chicago. Um, it was what, the Holy City was the name because of the gang affiliation, right? Yep. Vice Lords. So this is what all of you were up against. And what struck me is I'm like, this is not track and field. This is not football we're talking about, or basketball. <laughs> the whitest, most exclusive, expensive, sport to get into. That's what you all signed up for. Yes, absolutely. It was, you know, I always, you know, I always say the, I'll quote Rosa Parks when she said that I didn't know I was making history. I just knew that I couldn't give up. Right. And so um, I knew again, that this was something great and the opportunity could be great because it was so different and every race, you know, it's outside of your city except for one, right? And I'm like, wow, I've never been anywhere. Like, this is unique and this is different. Um, but again, there were so many people on my team that understood the opportunity. But because this world, I mean, hard, navigating through the west side of Chicago was hard. Now we had to navigate through a white space, right? That white elite space that um, we knew nothing about where you at the boathouse and you share with three private schools and every day at practice seems like a away game. Like it doesn't feel like it's your home, but it's your home boathouse and everyone's staring at you, right? And you go to a race and you're so isolated, right? And you have the oldest boats in the neighborhood. You have the most novice coach in the city. So when we were on the water, it wasn't that we wasn't faster than anyone, it was an equity issue, right? We didn't have the best coach. Our boat couldn't move quite as smooth as the other boats. We didn't have enough erg machines. And so uh, it, it, it was a battle, but we just knew every day that we couldn't give up. And at some point we looked back and was like, you know, we have gone way too far. <laughs> we can't turn back now. Can't turn back now. Turn back now. So what started off as pizza and maybe like a travel or a day out of school clearly turned into much more for all of you. On the water, in those white spaces, were there any times where you were actually embraced, where you felt seen by the rowing community? Yeah, you know, it, uh, the sport of rowing measures success one way, and that's by gold medals, right? Um, and, or getting into an ivy. Uh, and I think the times we felt seen were the times that, you know, there was a like erg race and we killed and our scores were awesome, right? Our, we were only seen by our athletic abilities and nothing else, not with what we're facing on the west side of Chicago, not by being the only, not even that, right? It was really about speed. And so if we didn't have the speed, we, we wouldn't embrace, right? And so um, that was the only time, but I do know the, it was the last race, like after, you know, Rowing for a couple years and a half, you know, like really killing everyone on the water and, and at the end losing that race um, by very little because I caught a crab was I felt like the only time I really felt embraced by others. They saw you. That's when they, they really saw you. Yeah. yeah that's when, that, you know, it's, there's a part in the film where one of the coaches said that I didn't think the program was a success. Like they didn't know, you know, no one was rowing in college. Oh, yeah, 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 no one, no, uh, they didn't win. They didn't win any gold medals. And that shows that, again, that people measure this success in this Ivy League sport by gold medals. For us, overcoming the fear of water was a win for our culture, right? So many black boys, I mean, what Chicago has been trying to solve for so long, how do we get these different gang members yeah. to build a bond and to build a brotherhood? Rowan has solved for us. That was the biggest win. I mean, traveling two hours a day to the boat house on a train, which no private school would do. They all showed up in, you know, in cars and Mercedes, right? 
Like those were wins in that commitment that we found on the water and how we trust in the process and showed up every day, regardless of all the things we've been through at home. When no one, no one could survive the things that we were going through, but we still showed up. Those wins were the wins that I wish the world at that time uh, measured us by. Yeah. Oh, th it's so profound you hearing that because to your point, your, your rivals weren't up against what you all were up against, right? And you all were escaping violence, death, right? Gang activity. What really does strike me though in the film is you, you all didn't have idle time. Rowing gave you almost like an escape, a place to go. So you really didn't have the time to be distracted or lured in to that life, right? Yeah, right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I always say that, you know, and you you hear from rowers now, you know, they, you know, they say, oh, you know, I I I I I, I live to row. I live to row. And I was like, we row to live. Yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a literal thing you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Do you ever let yourself think about what would have happened if I didn't walk into that gymnasium or that lunchroom, wherever the pizza was that day? I know you had to come back a second time, but do you ever wonder what if I didn't sign up? Yeah, you know, I think my answer is different from my teammates. Some of them would say, I, would, I was a dead man. I, I would have been a dead man. I was in gangs. I was heavily, heavily involved in the gang. I don't know if I would be alive because there was, I experienced so much every day, gunshots and running for my life, just being in a neighborhood with no opportunities, right? Yeah. For me, you know, my mom, my mom recovered from drugs and, 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 and she began to make a great life for us. I think I would have been fine, but I wouldn't have an opportunity to show my leadership. Yeah. I wouldn't have an opportunity to grow beyond um, uh, my community. Right, I, I started thinking more global as I began to travel. Right, and I think um, you know, again, Rowan gave me those opportunities. Yeah, I think it it, it broadened your horizon. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it made you think about what is possible. Right, almost like, but like you're saying, I can go beyond my my neighborhood. I can go beyond my my four walls. Right, I can go beyond Chicago even if I want to. That's what it made accessible. I think to you in your own mind. Why did you become the leader? Like, what, what was it about you that allowed you to rise up and be a leader? Yeah, I think, again, it was, you know, my mom, right? Like, forcing us to go to church and listening to these leaders all day long. You know, I'm like, gosh, all right, all right already. I, I'm going to be a leader one day. I get it. I understand. I know what I have to do, you know? But I think, for me, it was, um, you know, I have to say, so I was speaking in Harlem, to um, these group of young black men. Mm -hmm. And I asked each of them, what's your dream? What's your dream? What's your dream? And then there was one kid said to eat at Chipotle, a little local. I know this, Chipotle. I, I'm from yeah. High Park, not from High Park, but I lived in High Park for a few oh, okay. years. I went to the University yeah. of Illinois for 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Okay, okay. So a little, little restaurant, you know, fast food restaurant. And everyone started laughing, but he was so serious, right? Yeah. It wasn't McDonald's, but Chipotle is like one little step up. Yes. But you should have access to it. And I remember saying, wow, like you can tell you're serious. And so I gave the school counselor $20 out there and said, you have to make sure you eat that Chipotle. Because if you can eliminate that small dream, yeah. there's room for bigger dreams, yeah. right? And, and for me, the moment I started rowing, I just wanted to go downtown. That was my only dream. 15 years in Chicago, I'd never been downtown. And the moment I went downtown, I was like, I gotta go out of town. Right? And so we go to Wisconsin for a day trip. I'm like, we had a week long trip. And so even learning how to swim, overcoming the fear of water, trusting in someone, every day I felt like dreams were being eliminated in a small amount of time in just a couple months. And so again, like I said earlier, before I knew it, in two months, I have been more places than anyone that's on a basketball, football, or baseball team in my school. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, you know, I was challenged by the coach because I was asking about leadership. I was saying, hey, what else we got going on next? I want to eliminate more dreams. And so I think just asking questions and showing up and being aware that my goals were being eliminated was uh, 
what was uh, something the coaches saw in me. They, so they began to uh, begin investing a little bit more in me. And that's how I kind of grown into leadership. Yeah, I love that uh, saying that you um, told us about how your coach said, basically, if you conquer one fear, you know. Life gets life... a lot less scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that amazing, right? Like when you yeah. think about it. Yes, it's so true. Because some people will say to me, like, Arshe, you was just this fearless kid growing up. And I was like, no, like, I, I, I was scared. But you courageous. You had to face it. You had to face yeah, it. Yes. Courageous me doesn't mean that you're fearless. It means do it afraid. Anyway, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so um, that was, uh, yeah, that, that's what it was for me. Yeah. The other thing, too, that really struck me is the fact that, you know, I was on the track team. I grew up doing track. And, you know, there's a, there's a swag level to, to being that, you know, football, basketball. Y'all were some rowers now, okay? So not only did you face the white lens and the white gaze and not necessarily being embraced there, what was it like on the, in, your, in your high school hallways, at home, or even in your neighborhoods? Like, that was not easy. No, that was not easy. I mean, you know, I was like, come on, why everybody's on my case? Let's pick on the, the track and field people. They just running, you know? We run all day long. <laughs> it's a circle. Nowhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you know, it, I mean, we will walk in the school and the football players will be ready. They, be, they will make beats on the lockers and singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat, like hip hop style, messing with us. You know what I mean? And we had football coaches who were, would try to recruit us to say, it's not a real sport. You're wasting your time. Play football, play basketball. Um, and then you would get those who say, you know, they, they, you know, they have you guys rowing around like y'all in a slave ship. You know what I mean? Like that was like hurtful, you know? And then you had parents who really just didn't understand it. They was like, hey, this sport ain't going to make you any money in the future. Like get, pick up one of those ball sports. So, I mean, we went through it at home, at the boathouse, and at regattas. And, and, you know, I always tell people that, you know, we had to prepare for race days and, and, and race issues and, and a lot more than that. And that was mentally exhausting, you know? Imagine. And this is the thing, too. Like, if we put ourselves back to high school, you're so impressionable. Your reputation like where you fit in is so important. So I think all of us hearing you can only really imagine what it's like to, and maybe they weren't mocking you in a way that was like, you know, super derogatory. Maybe they're teasing you and jesting, but you still, like you said, have to like go up against that every time. And that's exhausting work to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, why, why didn't you and your, your core teammates ever quit? Like, can you let us in on what that was about? Yeah, I think that it was more of, I mean, many of you have saw this in the film where they talk more about the trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when you walk out your door and, and you skip over pools of blood and you hear gunshots when you sleep and run for your life, like, again, you experience what most soldiers have experienced in war, but before you're 15 years old. So you can't go to school thinking what's 20 percent a half or who really discovered america when right. you, you know you heard gunshots all night you don't know if you're gonna live right so it's hard to think into the future or be a good test taker when you're going through all those things and so that trauma takes over your life i mean whenever a mass shooting happened in suburban schools right away they say in the news we yes. send in trauma counselors yeah we had we had no access to that and we experienced this every day but I think the moment, I'll tell you the power of outdoor sports, the moment we got on the water and found the magic in the boat, I mean, before it became a sport to compete, it was a sport that was purely about meditation for us. Mm -hmm. It's remnant, that constant, just same motion, the, the waves in the water, the blades sl slapping against the waves, no police sirens, no gunshots, no broken street glass. You're just downloading that serenity and you're following the person in front of you. And there's only one sound, right? And that's from the coxswain or the coach. And they're saying, sit tall, breathe. You belong here. And that's two hours a day where you finally get a chance to escape the noise and focus truly on yourself and the person who sits in front of you and the person who sits behind you. 
and, and, and that reduced the trauma in our life. Like teachers was called everybody walking storms because we would get upset, but that sport calmed the storm in all of us. And I think the fact that we showed up every day with no fears, nothing to prove, all, you know, all just kind of, well, well, we did fear the water, but we overcame those fears together. We was able to build a bond by being isolated and our trauma was reduced together because it's something that we always wanted to experience. It drew us close. So we knew um, for those who truly felt that way on the water, we felt like if we left that team, we, 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 uh, we are entering back into that world of trauma. Like that piece, we didn't want to leave that piece. And I think that's what kept us together. So collectively, the sport represent peace. And it was it's pretty hard to leave peace once you really, truly experience it. And I think that's, that's what kept us going. And, um, and, and the coaches, right? They were great coaches. It wasn't about just fast boats. They were really great human development coaches. Uh, that, you know, you're going to be a great human first, a great teammate, and then let's talk about being fast. You know what, you you just gave us a perfect glimpse of really what that time in your lives was like. And to me, it was really rowing and your coaches, they were a surrogate for a lot of the things that were lacking in your lives and in your community. And it seems like all of you decided, I'm going to cling to this. I'm going to not let this opportunity pass me by which honestly is not something that everyone can do, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you all had to face your fears, one, the stigma, one, being in a sport where you're not necessarily, you know, seen all the time. And then you stayed in that, right? Um, for me, I want to know, and, and what's interesting with rowing, because, you know, I keep talking about I was a track and field athlete. You know, our stadiums are packed, 60,000, 80,000 at the Olympics. And then on the water, there's no crowd. There is no roar. You say to the <laughs> coxman, right? So I could imagine, and I love noise, I love chaos. So there, I could imagine for you, there's a serenity. I, I, I hear what you're saying now, even watching the film and thinking back and the rhythmic of it, right? Where when you probably go to your neighborhoods, you know, the noise, the chaos, the gunshots that you described, it's almost like you could enter a whole different world where you're safe. Yes, it was, it was entering, entering that realm. Like, I finally got it. Like, it wasn't that way for me, but I finally got it. Well, my mom talked about how that church was her safe place, that place where she could meditate and, and, and feel like at peace. Like I, everything that she told me, and I was like, really? I felt that, you know, on the water, it, it, the tables kind of turned. I'm like, mom, why are you always at church? She'd be like, or she, why are you always in that row? You know what I mean? And I was like, because I understand now, <laughs> you know? And, and I think that's the thing that I love about rowing and the people that row is that there are no cheerleaders. There are no busload of fans. There are no million dollar contra contracts after college, right? But when you when you will find a group of people who will break their backs, rip apart their hands for themselves and the person who sits in front of them and the person who sits behind them. And I was like, that's the kind of people I need in my life. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing too is all of you are, you know, I know you weren't particularly into gang activity, but I believe that some of the your teammates were. So in the early days, how did that kind of melt away, right? Did it, did it still present itself, your affiliations or their affiliations? It did for the first year. I mean, that was moments, I'll talk more about this in the book, where Preston and Alvin rolled together for like eight months, same team, pulled for each other, um, rooted for each other. And then there was a gang fight in school. And Preston's like... I'm gonna have to fight with Alvin, a fight against Alvin and his crew after. Alvin was like, you better tell Preston to run because, and I'm like, guys, are you kidding me? Like, we were just at practice eating, eating pizza yesterday. But it was like, this is the way we survive, right? And these decisions were rough on 16, 17 year old boys, right? And, and so I remember saying, Alvin, you gotta fix this. You gotta fix it. You know what I mean? And talking to Preston, that fight didn't happen. Um, if you want to know why, please pick up the book on Amazon. No, but, um, you know, it's, it, 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 yes, but it, it took some time, right? And I think that the guys understand why they joined the gang and, and they saw that Alvin life got better, that Preston life eventually got better. And, and I think eventually guys joined a team and build a brotherhood. And it was those long van rides where we built that relationship where we understand we don't have to go back. And it was the coaches being there, showing up to the neighborhood for us sometimes. Um, 
And so that's how that eventually happened. It was like after a year, but that first year was rough. It was a lot of arguments, some fights. Ew, we, we went through it. And, uh, but again, the coaches had to strategize. They had to talk, you know, use icebreakers before practice. They had to create um, uh, workshops for us to uh, understand who we are and our dopeness and, 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 and the history of where we came from and our brotherhood. Like we had to, they had to incorporate these workshops into our practice and into our workouts. And it was, and, and that's how we learned, right? And that's how we began to understand each other a lot more. Yeah. I can imagine how much gratitude you have for them, right? The fact that they brought this sport to, you know, Manly High School and that they mentored you and they nurtured you in it, right? Because yeah. I feel that way about my coaches and my mentors. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. I'm from Canada. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. But it was really the coaches that made sure that I didn't fall through the cracks. And if there was like an entry fee and my mom couldn't afford it, it's like, cool, we have her, right? And it's it takes those people, you know, around you to really see you and want to help and want to change. So I can only imagine how much gratitude you have. So, so much gratitude. And even now, like they so supportive, you know what I mean? And, and everything we do and, um, and they understand, right. Us, they understand our community. And one of the decisions that, you know, me and Mary made was like, Hey, these kind of films are always about coaches and, and, and uh, the students. But I think let's eliminate the coaches and add the moms right to the film, right? And the, it, the coaches wasn't like, oh, I need my time to shine, right? They understood that because it was always about us, not about them, their reputation, or how many medals they won. It, it, was, uh, it was truly a family atmosphere. That's a beautiful thing. So let's talk about some of the, the, the people behind this film because you got some stars, you got some names. So Mary Mazio, I believe that's how I say her last name, correct? Yes. Um, I watched a few of her interviews and she is, I mean, you paired up with the right person because she is behind this thing 100%. She speaks so highly of you. And it's clear, I think she said she'd gotten the book and loved the book. And she's like, this didn't happen. <laughs> like she was skeptical about the story even happening. But can you talk to us about how um, the, the, the partnership came together and how the film came together? Because like we said, it's based on the book. Yeah, you know, I mean, before Mary, I was tweeting out to Will Smith, Steven Spielberg, Ava, somebody got to do this movie, you know, <laughs> you know, Rowan teaches you how to go after it. And so, uh, you know, none of them respond. But, um, you know, Mary read the book and she tweeted out to me that loved the book. And, you know, I looked her up and, and it was like, oh, gosh, she did some good Rower. work. No, yeah. And, and it was a rower. And not only did it really good work, her work is about social change. And, um, and so, you know, I, I reached out, like, would you ever? And she was like, um, yeah, you know? And so the partnership started and I was like, hey, this is a great story. Let's get some heavy hitters involved. You know what I mean? And uh, she called up Common. You know, for me, it's like, first time you think of a narrator, you're like, where's Morgan Freeman, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Common was the most perfect person. He was amazing. Uh, and I was able to talk to him about the film and then Grant Hill, who loved um, the project and Dwayne Wade. And I think, again, as we talked a little bit earlier, they, it, it, they loved the fact that our team wasn't all about the gold medals. Like, di they didn't win everything, which most stories are about. It was about just, you know, overcoming those obstacles and keep going after it. And they kept going after it and kept going after it. And, and, um, and it was so unique, you know, uh, it was rowing. And so um, it was. It was good to have those guys a part of the story. Yeah, because I, I saw that, and I, and I, you know, Common's voice is, you know, Academy Award winner. His voice, you can recognize it anywhere. He's like, he's like the next Morgan Freeman, right? And he's he's such an icon in the city of Chicago, of course, but like at large. And so I'm like, right on that they would put their name to this story, right? And I'm glad you never give gave up because I think that's something that sport teaches us, right? Like not giving up, not stopping. And you realize that this is a unique story. This is a profound story. It's worthy of being told. And you didn't wait for anyone. You were like, I'm gonna make sure that this story is not forgotten and it's told in this way. So hats off to you for that. So I'm gonna wrap up with a few more questions because I really wanna know about um, in the film when you invite the police to be a part of things. I wanna know the empathy behind that for you, what that was like and what you really think the message was with having them connected. Yeah, for me, you know, one of the moms said, 
you know, this is like outside of filming. Uh, she's like, the two things that scares me in Chicago is when my black son is in a different neighborhood and my black son interaction with the police. Now I have spent my life changing that interaction, trying to change that interaction in the neighborhoods of Chicago, but not attacking the other fear that these moms have. And, you know, I protest, I have helped uh, in many ways to be a part of and believe in police reform and because and, 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 the race relationship is so toxic, you know, and, and, and you know, I've never committed a crime or, or been suspended from school, but still had my face pressed down a police car numerous of times, right? And, you know, but at the, at the end of the day, um, regardless of what I do today in my protests or what I post about tomorrow morning, those same cops will still be working on my block. So what can I do tomorrow? What, what can I do right now? And, and I said, they need to know our names. Like all these guys, teenage boys are walking around with their hoodies on, great kids, but they walk around the neighborhood and they need to know our name. And so I presented to the guys and they were like, what, 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 what? You know? And what I said is that, you know, and one of the things I wish as a kid, I was like, if this cop just, while my face is on the police car, I'm thinking if they just knew who I was and, the, and what I do and the work I put in to, to, to try to change things as a young kid. And I wanted the guys on our block, those cops to understand who we were. And what I told the guys was, as a teacher, you will always forget some of your students. As a student, you'll never forget your teacher. And we have an opportunity to be a teacher here. And so we invited them out and it was awkward at first, but you know, we, you know, we started rowing and breaking some ice and we took them down to the tanks and, and I started talking and talking about my life and the lessons I've learned through the sport, right? As they were rowing. And then we took them back to the same water where we didn't get along at first, right? where uh, we talked about that trauma and that same water that helped us heal and unite. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it, it was, we had a good time and I knew one race, the plan was one, ra one time on the water. And I was like, it's not enough, right? It, it's not enough. They need to know who we are. And fast forward, I would say that, you know, they would tell you today, because we got a group chat, we talk all the time. We say, hey, you should read this book. Blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, you know, they would tell you that Preston wears his hoodie inside his pants, but he's one of the great, best entrepreneurs in the neighborhood, right? They would say that Alvin grew up not making bad choices, but hard choices, mm -hmm. challenging choices to survive. And when George Floyd was murdered, one of the cops right away sent us the photo of him meeting with Black activists. And he was like, I feel the pain of your community, right? If you go Officer Lewis, if you go on his page, he's like, yes, Black Lives Matter. These are the things that they don't show in process. Now for a Chicago cop to say that was like crazy, right? right? And then another cop who I, I, I love this guy. And, and, and he, he's, every book that I've told him he should read from the new Jim Crow to stamp, he's read them. And it, what he said to us is that, you know, when George Floyd was murdered, a lot of bricks was thrown at me. Um, I couldn't, you know, it, it, was, it was, it sucked, but I can take my uniform off, but you can't take your black skin off. Uh -huh. And I said, you're right, but I need you to tell your colleagues that. Now we wouldn't be able to have that conversation if I just mailed my book to him, right? If I was standing on the other side of the street, facing mm -hmm. off against him, I wanted to create an opportunity. And I know sports unites folks to have the challenging conversations. Now you and I know as, as an athletes that you don't win anything comfortable. You have to be uncomfortable the whole time to get the results you want. And it was uncomfortable at times with different conversations, but the, the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, they know our names, they know our teenagers' names. And that scene with the guys and the kids in the, in the water tanks, the cops were actually there watching that. And you can tell they was like, they've never seen anything like it. Now it doesn't change the system, right? It's so much work to do, but I felt like this was the best um, decision uh, for our block. Yeah. And, and that's why I decided to do that. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even about trying to change the world. It sounds like you're just trying to change where you are and where you live and have that really ripple out. 
because you're right, like you reaching out to them and having these interactions just as men, just as humans, right? Changes, and I hate to say it because it shouldn't be our job, but their perception, right? Because they now see our shade. Not a black man. They see our shade and all that you are and all that you, you know, you bring. And almost, there's almost this kind of like, oh, I get it now. Because maybe they would have never spoken to you or gotten to know you on that real, like, just basic human level. But yeah. you were able to bridge that. Yeah. And you know what? And, and people say... Oh, Arshay, you, you know, I saw in articles, he built this bridge and he's here to build bridges. And it wasn't just building bridges. Remember, it was, we, we were taught how to survive. And it was a decision based on survival for us and our teenage kids, you know? Like, hey, if we do this, they know our kids' names. So it was also learning to survive. Yeah, so they've encountered stop your daughter, stop your son you know, there's a little piece of you that says it might be an officer that knows us, knows our family. Yeah, you know, it's, it's and I think the last thing was said is that you think about like Elijah McClain who, who was killed by the cops, played violins with cats. Now, if the cops on his play, if they just, that was his neighborhood, if they just knew his name and what he'd done, they would say, wait a minute, that's Elijah, we, we know who he is. And so, walking and walking and being. Yes, exactly. And so, um, that's, that was the goal behind it, to try to create opportunities for them to know who we are, our dopeness, how much we love our kids, and, and, uh, and, and we're making history here. Yeah, no, you, you are, and you have made history, and you'll continue making history. Okay, I don't have much more time with you, and I feel like I'm just hogging you, and <laughs> so I'll be snappy, but I really want to know, one of the parts in the film that I really connected with, um, I have a two-year-old daughter, her name is Nova. And um, I saw all of you really connecting with your children through rowing. So I wanted to know your thoughts on the legacy of this film, what you hopes it will, it will do, you know, what your children have said about it and kind of like where you are about that. Yeah, you know, the, before the film, it was just like a book where the kids, the teenage kids still never read. It was like, ah, oh, it's rowing. We got to play basketball and football. But I think, you know, you know, them all seeing the power of the sport and how to change their lives made them interested in rowing. Uh, they love it, right? They, they, I mean, you hear from Malcolm Preston and Alan, and he's like, yeah, my son thinks oh, I'm a hero now. Like, I, you know, I'm famous and, and, you know, and, and they love it and they want to try it out. You know, I think that uh, it was another way to bond, right? And, and, and we, underst we understand, you know, since we were young that it's, it's a bonding sport. And so they fell in love with it. And I think the legacy is, is, is to use the lessons of the sport or, in, or sports, right, um, in our everyday life and use those lessons in our family life and our career life, right? And I think that gives us the results that we want. We would get the results that we want. And, you know, in sports, it's like, what's our goal? What's our mission? What's our vision? Let's go after it. Let's make it happen, right? Let's not give up. So it, it's really like communicating those messages to our kids, not by just telling them, but through sports, right? And so I think uh, that's the thing. And, and for me, you know, I'm still on the move to make, making sure that each and every boathouse in our country um, reflects the diversity in its city and break it down those barriers, right? Dismantling those, dismantling those barriers to stop the young people who grew up like I did to join this beautiful sport, right? And, and so I am working with that with a great team. We started a most beautiful thing inclusion fund and we are starting and helping programs all over the country you know, like a program like Manly, what, what, what do they need? How can we um, help uh, the program um, be who they ought to be? And so we, we donate, we help, we come, we recruit, and we do all these amazing things. And, 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 I, and the last goal is uh, for the Olympics in our country, LA 2028, 20, right? Um, we want to make sure that boat reflects the diversity in our country. That's only that. And the 100 plus years of this sport been an uh, Olympic sport, there's only been one black person who rode on American soil in the Olympics. And so we hope to change that LA 28. I'm gonna look out for that. I'm gonna look out, <laughs> I believe it. I believe it that that will happen. I mean, you can retire. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you retire now, you can, you can come back to the sport. We could, you know. And <laughs> Mike could, you know, acts up now when I'm trying to do anything physical. That might be a lot to ask. So, <laughs> 
before I let you go, um, I want to know what teenage Arche would say to the Arche today, or even vice versa. Do you do you let yourself do that? Because sometimes I'm like, teenage, you'd be like, you're doing what? Like, would you not be so proud? Would he not be so proud and all, like out of his mind of what you're doing and where you are? Wow, it's yeah, I, I think so. I feel like the now Arche is still honestly so proud of the young Arche because when I look back I'm like how did you go through this stuff like how you know my life is a little bit better now and but you know it's just like how did that kid accomplish those things you know and I think what I would tell that kid even before rowing because there's a lot of young Arches out there is that you don't have to fight alone because mm -hmm. before rowing I did my anxiety mm -hmm. uh depression everything I went through my doubt my fears I I, I faced it alone and I was okay with that and struggled but you don't have to and sports taught me that and uh and I think the younger Arche would say to the older Arche keep going we you know we started this journey many years ago and you didn't give up that was that was that was the only dream not to give up and it, it gets you where you want to be I look at all that you've created all that you've done all that you clearly are going to go on to do like it is it is just it is wonderful it's a powerful story it's a positive story i mean i i have the book now and i cannot wait to to read it and to dig in and can you let us know because i want people to know just because you've read the document seen the documentary rather doesn't mean that you can't and you should not read the book they should because i imagine there's some details that you really can get into in your book but yeah, the book, you know, in the film, it, it kind of seems like it was like everything was like pounded to one year. It was like three years of rowing in this book, right? It was the day-to-day -day what it was like when I went into Malcolm's home and hung out there, when I went into Alvin's house every day, what it was like when I went to Preston's house, the, the things that we went through day-to-day, -day, right? The first visit at a restaurant, the first restaurant we went to, and they, you know, this all-white neighborhood, and they didn't let us in right? You know, the interactions with those kids from the private schools at the boathouse, right? Do we get more on Grace? Do we get more on Miss, on Miss Grace? Uh, you get a lot more on, uh, on Miss Grace. <laughs> you know, and so that teen, teenage life and what Chicago was like and what our parents were like, um, and also what Ken and his family was like and the coaches and their family. So you get a lot more of that. So please check it out. Um, you would enjoy it. And you can find me on, on Instagram or Twitter, uh, easily. What's your handles? Where can we exactly find you? Like, what would we type in? Arshea Cooper, Instagram, Arshea Cooper, Twitter, or you go to www.arsheacooper.com. Okay, that's easy, because you know some people have their names, and then it's a whole different handle, and you don't know how to find yeah. it. So that is Arshea Cooper, because we know that one. Arshea, <laughs> honestly, I, I probably went double over time. I hope I didn't make you late for something. <laughs> No, it's all good. No, so, thank you. It was nice chatting. Thank you. Nice chatting with you. And yes, get that book, everyone. This film is wonderful. Tell people that you love it. I think word of mouth is huge now, especially in the pandemic, to get people to, you know, gift books, buy books, and to really, really check out this wonderful documentary. Thank you, Arshe, for your time. Thank you. And Hudson is hoping to bring, Hudson Boats in Canada is hoping to bring me out. So when I go out on the water, I'm hoping I can bring you out too. I'll be there, but you know, I need my water wings because, you know, <laughs> they're lacking. They're lacking. <laughs> I got you. But, but I, I might could do it if it's not cold out. <laughs> yes, I got you. I got you. I hope to see you in Canada, Arshay. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, I'm going.